What's going on, everybody? Welcome, everyone, to the Best of Worst of, the podcast where we take the bad with the good in the world of pop culture. My name is Jason, and joining me today, the real voice behind Joe Exotic's music videos, my co-host, Jesse. <laughs> if only. I, I did the voice for the, all the tigers in that show. No one knows that. I just came in for like half a day and just went, <laughs> like 35 <laughs> times. Like, do it with a little more, with, you're, you need to be a little sad. Okay, this is after the fire, okay? These, you knew these alligators, okay? So channel that emotion. Okay. Right. Perfect. Okay. They paid me in highbrow rings. You're, you're odd. <laughs> <laughs> you're oddly, uh, you're oddly great at that. <laughs> I could be the next, next Frank Welker. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Hey, so. uh, well, welcome everybody. Jesse, why don't you tell us, uh, kind of what we're what we're going to we get got, into today on Best yes. of War stuff. So, uh, also, I thought about this today, Jason. You know, we're recording from different states, uh, of course, due to uh, the uh, social distancing measures that everyone's taking. Hopefully, everyone is taking, but... That's I right, one believe. state away, right? Yes, That's so technically, this makes us like a national broadcast. <laughs> oh, wow. Multi-state. <laughs> I love it. Um, but... So speaking of the social distancing, quarantining, COVID-19, and all these things that I'm sure you're all very familiar with, uh, we wanted to say that through all the uncertainty and the turmoil of this pandemic, it's important, I think, to remember that we are all in this together, we need to be looking out for each other. Mm-hmm. We all have so much in common. You know, We want to see our loved ones and ourselves happy and healthy and with the cleanest of anuses. Um, Jason and I cannot help you all with the last one, aside from like maybe some helpful tips, I suppose. <laughs> Get a bidet. Yeah, dude, I'm I'm telling you, <laughs> we're finally we got it's the baby boomer generation that's still keeping bidets in the in the uh, um, as uh, pariahs. You know, it's a uh, right. it's not an acceptable thing. You know, give it another twenty years, everyone will have a bidet. Yeah. Um, and we wouldn't be in this mess. Um, <laughs> but uh, aside from those uh, um, hygienic tips, uh, this week we wanted to do something that would hopefully bring uh, you all some happiness. But rather than quitting podcasting forever, uh, we are going to <laughs> instead offer a uh, smattering of shows and movies currently streaming for your quarantine viewing pleasure. But first... As always, let's get into our favorite alliterative section. Fun facts! That's it. I love that one. It was almost a Doc Brown impression. <laughs> Fun facts! No, that's not it. I'm doing the. I'm doing Bernie Sanders again. <laughs> um, Listen here, okay. Marty. We gotta get. To... <laughs> Great Scott, Marty. But that's, yes, it's still, that's, no, it's still Bernie no, Sanders. No, it's very good. It's very good. It's a younger Bernie Sanders. It's Bernie Sanders in like the sixth grade. <laughs> <laughs> I missed waffle on the spelling bee. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, that's a true story. I misspelled the word waffle in the spelling bee in the sixth grade. I did E-L instead of L-E. Interesting. The one I also got have... was apartment Oh. in the fourth that... grade. Yeah. Mm. I, uh, I also have intentionally thrown two spelling bees in my life um that maybe we'll i'll get to that story another time <laughs> okay um so for our fun fact section let's do this so we're doing quarantine streams so let's do some quarantine facts Love the it. word quarantine comes from the venetian word quarantina <laughs> i don't know why i did it with an accent but quarantina which means 40 days as this was the time frame at which ships were were to remain isolated before the crew and any passengers could go ashore due to the Black Plague, which uh, I think we can say now in, in hindsight was pretty bad. Pretty bad. Did, did yeah. they call it the Black Plague in that day, or was it just called the flu? Uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, well, I wonder, I was, you know, because like, well, like World War One wasn't World War One, obviously, at the time. It was the Great War. So I wonder right. what, you know, they did like, you know, I, I don't know. He's got the bumps or something for Black Plague. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he's got exploding <laughs> armpit syndrome. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, in more uh, 
etymological terms. <laughs> I had to think of that. Etymology is words, right? Entomology is insects. Yes. Yes. Etym- etymology. And epidemiology. <laughs> epidemiologists that are having so their smart. finest day <laughs> like they've been sitting around waiting to make it make the rounds on television and be taken seriously epidemiologists yeah what they was are the... secretly just dancing in their <laughs> closets i don't know what they're well doing. hopefully well hopefully they are they're not near other people dancing so yes. um speaking of uh epidemiology the word epidemic is greek and I didn't know this. It means upon people. Huh. Like much like our podcast is an epidemic. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, pandemic, uh, as the name sort of suggests, means all pe- all the people in Greek. Um, so there's your uh, the, there's your his- not history etymology lesson. There we go. <laughs> that um, uh, that sounds. I think that's intriguing. I, I like word derivations. Yeah, I do too. I, the quarantine thing, epidemic and pandemic, not to toot my own horn, but I think I could, probably could have figured that out. Um, but quarantine, I didn't know. There was also apparently there's uh, there was another uh, another word that was thirty days. I forget what it what it was there. Um, tre for tre quarenta. Or, well, tre, no, because the quarantena. Trentena, maybe. <laughs> Trentena. There's got to be a portion of our of our listeners who are etymologists, so let us know. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, there was an uh, and also uh, there is an uh, an endemic is another type of um, uh, pandemic epidemic sort of uh, sister. There we'll call it. Uh, an endemic is a is like um, some is a something that's contagious and it spreads but it's maintained so like chicken pox which i guess chicken pox they have a vaccine for but like when we were younger you know people everyone got chicken pox but they knew people were gonna get chicken pox it wasn't a big deal um that would be an endemic that'd be an endemic yes so that's the quarantine part of our fun facts now let's go to the streaming part of our fun facts tell us about one of the most famous streaming services jason well, one of the most famous streaming services is <laughs> Amazon Prime Video. I don't know why I just turned started, into a radio announcement. I know there. Morning Zoo. We still got to do that. We 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 need to do like top. We need to do like uh, best and worst radio like radio movies, like movies about you know like uh, the radio um, industry. You know, like uh, I don't know, you could do Airheads or something. I don't know. We um, should do that, and we and should do, do the whole open oh. up through Fun Facts. In in morning zoo style As radio. Morning zoo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's anyway, okay. what you do. All right. <laughs> uh Amazon Prime Video, one of the uh one of the earliest launching streaming services in the US in September of September seventh, two thousand six. Yeah. Who knew it was that long ago? And it had a different name. It was called Amazon Unbox. Yeah, no one knew about what it. What a had... terrible name. They had six movies, and they were all the Tremors movies. <laughs> That's all wow. they could get the rights to. No, um, I did see something where, like, the number was low for when, as you would imagine, when these streaming services started. I think, um, I want to say, like, when Netflix launched, which will, yeah, that'll be, oh, we'll get to that in a moment. But when Netflix launched, they had, I want to say it was like, um, it was under a thousand titles, which seems still like a lot, but their DVD library was like over like a hundred thousand movies or something. So like they had a hard time getting people to buy into it, which Amazon of course had now that obviously has changed dramatically um, <laughs> since uh, Amazon primes or I'm, I'm going to start calling it Amazon unbox <laughs> just to be a hipster. <laughs> Like people like, hey, oh, you got to check out the marvelous Mrs. Maisel on Prime. Like, oh, you mean Unbox? <laughs> um, uh-huh. Their greatest uh, rival, the Joker, to Amazon's Batman, or vice versa, depending on your leanings. Netflix launched its streaming platform in 2007. I think February 2007 is what I saw. Um, after, of course, it dominated the DVD rental market for a decade, leading to the tragic demise of Jason's college girlfriend, Blockbuster. 
Yeah, she was uh, she was my mistress throughout Jeez. most of uh, of the college years. Uh, I remember this is how this is how little I understood about where things were going. Don't ever ask me to prognosticate about where things are going. I won't because I don't know what it means. <laughs> um, <laughs> at my at my etymology lesson. That's the guy you got to go see when you turn forty. My um, <laughs> my etymology but, lesson for this week stopped at epidemic and pandemic. <laughs> I remember when I made the switch to not going to Blockbuster in person, and I did Blockbuster my, by mail because oh, okay. I couldn't bear I, I couldn't break up with them. I couldn't yeah. go to the Netflix. Then we went to the Netflix by mail, and I had both for a while so that yeah. I could have a lot of movies coming in and out. And you had to time it, right? You had to decide. Well, do I have a one movie plan? Do I have a three movie plan? How quick, Mm -hmm. like, can I turn around? And back then, if you were watching TV series, you'd be like, okay, well, there's four episodes on that disc and you do it. And I remember watching maybe something like 24 or something and you'd rent the discs and then there'd be that one, there'd be four or five episodes on a disc, but then you end up with like two episodes on this last disc and you're like, crud, I had to burn it. I had to go through all this just for two episodes. Now I got to send this back. You know, it was, it was this crazy thing like DVD by mail, but it seems so foreign, but I remember thinking this streaming thing's never going to catch on. Right. (laughs) Why am I not? Why would I ever not want a disc? Right. Like I remember thinking this and now to burden myself with walking to the DVD shelf to get a disc and put it into a player. Yeah. I can't, I can't imagine the the burden of it. (sighs) Yeah, I mean, I have to like, like, I have to like hook up a DVD player now. Like, I don't even have one just ready to go. <laughs> like, I'm right. like, okay, I got to move some HDMI cables around. Ah, forget it. You know, yeah, I right. mean, and now, I mean, we go to, I mean, we, if if there are movies that we want to rent, you know, that we have, you know, are on Redbox, they haven't got to a streaming service yet. Like, I just watched 1917 the other day. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Redbox is convenient and that works well. So, I mean, it. it once having seen where the industry went, it makes complete sense. But uh, I I was one of those people too. Like I remember thinking like, none of this is going to catch on. I remember, I mean, a friend of mine, I was in high school, uh, a friend of mine, his, his family was like the only person I knew who had Netflix and they did the, you know, the DVD um, by mail, of course. And they, uh, and I remember then like, like this is, pretty cool but i just don't see it ever catching on because they did uh, the selection wasn't great we watched a lot of like indie movies and stuff which in retrospect um i think really kind of shaped some of my taste in movies because like his mom would get a movie for like her and uh my friend's dad and then she'd get a movie for like me and my friend when i like hang out with him on the weekends and it was always some random like indie movie or something and like because it just they didn't have a big selection and then when mm-hmm. we would do tv shows what we would run into was uh we would get the first you know two disc let's say and it's 10 episodes and then you go to get disc three and it's taken and you got to wait for it to come back like they don't you yes. know someone else has disc three right now oh so you know it's yeah it's just the worst i don't know how we made it through that time it makes this pandemic look like a play date <laughs> it makes it look um, like an endemic you yes. know what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> we're learning things um so uh I did find this interesting. So Netflix, uh, Netflix's DVD by mail rental service um, is now available at DVD.com. They managed to snag that um, <laughs> that, That's you, that that domain after. Do you remember the whole? Oh gosh, do you remember oh, that moment? Oh yes. With I was going to go there. Quickster. They, yeah. They decided they, they were they rolling separated off them into another uh, website separate, and people were having an uproar, but they were going to call it quickster was to get your dvds through the mail yeah so you're telling me it's still up i can still go to dvd.com and rent netflix movies yes not only is it still up it still has a fair amount of subscribers which is what what will take us to our fill in the blank for this week one of them uh so they're so currently dvd.com which i think it says like if you go to it i didn't check but it says like dvd.com uh, a Netflix company. A Netflix company. Yep, there you go. Um, how many subscribers? As this is as of 2017, that was the most recent number I could find. But as of 2017, so I'm sure this number may have come down a little bit. But as of 2017, how many subscribers do does the DVD by mail service 
have. Is it only Netflix. in the U.S.? I think uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay. It has three million subscribers. Three point three million. Good job. What? Yeah. Yeah. What? You got one. Do you know what I almost said? Three point two. Oh. And man. I was like, eh, ah, now nah, we just can go around. Oh yeah, man, no. I feel so good 3. about being so close. I know that was good. Um, now, uh, as of 2020, what is their streaming service number of subscribers? The streaming Net- service Netflix. has 70 million. 167 million subscribers. Good gracious. A Times third of 15 the bucks a month? Yeah. Lord yeah. have mercy. Now, I was wondering, this might be getting to conspiracy theory territory, but I wonder if they're counting subscribers or users. Hmm. I could see where they were looking know. at. It'd have to be subscribers. That would be, <laughs> it seems almost illegal, <laughs> fraudulent. Um, one household has tens. I don't even know how many you can do, but um, Prime Video, uh, how many current number of streaming subscribers do they have, Jason? Current streaming subscribers. Now, Prime Video comes free with Amazon. So are right. you counting everybody that has Amazon Prime? So I'm going to say 140 million people. 150 million. You're on point today, man. Whoa, man. <laughs> Someone took their Metamucil. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, So, and this is something I found out interesting in my research. Uh, Prime, or excuse me, uh, Amazon estimates, or it is estimated that of am of the people who use Amazon, sixty percent of them are Prime users. At a hundred bucks a year, that's and then you know you're still. It's not like you're getting that Prime doesn't get you everything for free. You're still giving them money otherwise. It just gets yeah. The, you get a little bit it's cheaper. Free, and you get, you get right. a little sh- cheaper and you get the free shipping. Now and it's probably like what twelve percent of Prime members that watch Prime Video. Uh, I, I couldn't. I 20%. didn't see a statistic, but I tried to find something. I saw one thing that estimated around 30 use the stream, the streaming services. Of that 60% of Amazon users that are Prime Video, another of that 30% use or have used the streaming service or something. I'm, but um, there's just so many streaming services now. You know. Um, Speaking of that, I want to play a little impromptu game. Okay. I want to play a game. This where is we the go, casual version of, version of Saw. <laughs> we're gonna go back. We're gonna go back and forth. Okay. And we're gonna see how many streaming services we can name. Okay. So I'll name one. You name one, and we'll go back and forth until somebody gets stuck. And I want to do this kind of in in honor of there was a streaming service that launched today. I'm not gonna tell you the name of it yet. Okay. But it is a streaming service that launched today, and there are um, many others uh, coming in the coming months. So, okay. you know what? I'll defer to you. I'll let you go first. And okay, take real it quick. Hang on. Let's set a little ground rules. Are okay. we? Because almost every TV channel has their own streaming service now of some sort. So, can I say I, NBC? No. Okay. I need it to be a over-the-top, not affiliated with, not directly affiliated with a channel. Okay. The, like a broadcast channel or a over the network. I want an over the top thing. We, I, I don't know. Maybe we'll see no, if this no, is no, fun. We might we might get to five or six or eight of them. We'll see. All fun games start with a overabundance of rules. Um, okay. <laughs> I'll start Netflix. All right. I'm going to go Hulu. Okay. Amazon Prime Video. That was quick. <laughs> It it was. It was. I am going to go with Sling. Okay. Um, uh, Although I may have just violated a rule. Oh, why? Because they don't have any, like, original content. They just provide uh, other people's content. Oh, uh, see, I was, I, well, okay, well, I was, well, that's going to be real tough if we do original content. I was going to go with, like, that's Slither. Fine next or slither or whatever it is the 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 horror movie one okay i'm going to go with the one that launched today quibi i saw something about it but i had no idea what it was uh they're shows made for your phone in fact they're in an aspect ratio that converts and changes as you turn your phone and they're all 10 minute long episodes seven to seven to ten minute long 
They launched 24 shows today, and I heard they're just, eh. Yeah, okay. Well, there's Canopy, which Ooh, is Canopy. through your library. If you have a library card, you can get – your library has to participate. But from what I understand, a lot of libraries participate. I think you can watch like, what, three movies – four or five movies a week, something like that? Sure. Um, I know my, my library does not uh, – does not com- – uh, do that does not participate you know a fun version of this would be and we could probably do this within the next year you have to go alphabetically um that would be an added thing to this but i'm gonna go i'm gonna take canopy and i'm gonna i'm gonna add you by the way there's no research on this you have to do this from memory okay i am um i I know i know um (laughs) you're accusing me of being a cheater (laughs) no now i might be violating another rule i'm gonna go with peacock (laughs) That it NBC's? has it has yet to launch, but Peacock. <laughs> You're disqualified. Game over. So here's the thing. We I feel like we could end up actually going at this for a while. But here's what what we could almost I feel like I was almost going to start doing. It's just saying random like well, bad scrabble hands. To. Is this getting to where it's like Quibi, yeah. Zim Zam, Flip Flop? Right. <laughs> like, no, no, that, and that's we can stop now. But what I was hoping was <laughs> we would do this thing where I'd say Fubu. And you'd be like, no, that's not fun. But then you'd I be like, believed you. like, Fubi is one. <laughs> like, right. Uh, right. Or Tubi or Plato or Pluto is one. Right. Like we could do Pluto's it either. Pluto's pretty sweet. I like Pluto. Right. <laughs> Pluto is cool. Yeah, Pluto. Yeah, Pluto is, is just free TV. It's not even a, I mean, it's a streaming service, but it, it's, it costs nothing. There is no, I mean, there's ads, but I mean, like it's, it's, you go to at least on Roku TV. If you go to Pluto, it's just like you're looking at the old TV guide channel, and you or like a guide on like your you know, cable or satellite provider, and you just they have like channels dedicated to like different things. They have like a Fell Army channel that's just nothing but like you know like those YouTube Fell videos, and then they have a Mystery Science Theater channel. They have uh, okay. Rift Tracks channel. They have like True Crime channels. It's it's actually I really like it because mostly because of the Mystery Science Theater channel. But that's interesting. Yeah, it's actually pretty sweet. Um, All right, but, so thank okay. you for indulging me. That was yes. a s- stupid, but I thought would be kind of fun <laughs> to play with. That uh, describes our podcast. Uh, that's that's that that's our mission statement. Kind of stupid, but fun to play with. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's my personal motto. Yeah. <laughs> Insert blue collar joke, and let's move into our. Yes. Uh, um, our uh, best section for this week. So the idea, what we did here was we each picked three movies, three TV shows. Um, we'll try to keep this as tight as possible. But these are things that we definitely feel like you guys should get out and make an effort to watch if you haven't seen it. Um, I know uh, for me, um, I am not as well versed in the television as Jason is. Um, but, uh, for me, at least with the movies, I tried to pick things that like, it was really easy for me to look at like, Oh, well, Goodfellas is streaming on Netflix. Go watch Goodfellas. But you know, I'm like, a lot of people have seen it. It's kind of obvious you should go see Goodfellas. So I tried to pick things that I would think you either have seen, but haven't watched or have heard of, haven't watched or have never heard of. And uh, maybe this will will learn you some things. Um, that was my sort of criteria for movies. Okay. And for TV, Are I just gonna... had to find things that I'd watched. <laughs> I got, I got you. Are we gonna do? Um, are we gonna do kind of back and forth, one and one? Yeah. Or do you? Are you gonna do all three? How how do we want to do this? We'll, we'll go back and forth. I'll start Perfect. with uh, my first movie. Um. So it is on now, and I also kept everything to Amazon and Netflix. Just um almost because of as we were just uh mentioning <laughs> there's a ton of streaming services out there and i feel like netflix and uh amazon of course are going to be your most uh readily available or already accessed and subscribed to by folks um so first one this one is on netflix it is called green room we're in movies mm-hmm. by the way this is the, yes. my first movie movie called green room it came out in 2015 um it's directed by a uh a man named jeremy saunier uh he also directed a fantastic movie called blue ruin which is also on netflix that was his uh movie before green room i think before mm-hmm. that he had what murder party was yes. uh or um, which i have not seen but blue ruin is fantastic green room is even better and i haven't i heard middling things about his most recent what 
uh, hold the, the dark hold the dark the one set in the alaskan tundra it it's it's okay it's just slow okay um but uh, and that one has uh, correct me if i'm wrong that one has um jeffrey wright in it right who will be yes yes okay. who will be our next commissioner gordon to harken back to our batman episode from last week thank you oh. guys for listening to that one 2015 film directed by jeremy Sonier. Green Room. It stars the late Anton Yelchin, yeah. um, who tragically passed away about a year after this. Very tragically passed away. Um, uh, Imogen Poots, whose name always makes me laugh. Um, <laughs> she makes me laugh, a, but she's great. <laughs> she's a fantastic actress, and she's very good in this movie. And Patrick Stewart playing very much against type and uh, playing the sort of the villain in this movie. So um, basically, high sort of level view of this movie. It is... Um, uh, at the end of a disappointing tour, a punk band takes a last minute gig at a Nazi skinhead bar slash hangout slash headquarters uh, where things turn murderous, as they so often do with Nazis, um, which leads to the band fighting for their lives in an effort to escape and survive the evening. Um, it is a really wonderful suspense horror movie. If you're I'm not a big gore guy, but it's got some gore, gory stuff in there. It's used. Um, it's used well. It's not over the top, but if you're a fan of gore and horror movies, it's got a little bit of that for you. Um, uh, like I said, Jeremy Saunier is a fantastic director. I, uh, I, I need to, I, I want to watch Hold in the Dark just because I love what he, uh, Blue Rowan and Green Room are both great movies. Um, he's definitely someone to keep an eye out for. I think he's gonna, he just, it just has to be that right project that really catches people's attention. And I think he'll be a name a lot of people know here shortly um it's a fantastic movie patrick stewart uh is the nazi leader like the head of this nazi <laughs> base basically um and it's so interesting seeing him play sort of against type and play a very effective villain um essentially um it's a white knuckle like suspense movie i mean it is really good um and it, it it'll keep you on the edge of your seat um it's got like i said it's got the horror elements but if you're not a horror person don't let that turn you off because it's more suspense um but it's just got a little bit of that flavor for it so you know if you kind of like that if you're into horror you'll like it if you're into suspense more it's got its yeah. feet in both in both both places um and like i said uh anton yelchin who i've been a fan of for a while um he was in one of my favorite Stephen King adaptations when he was a uh, young boy, when he was about 12, Hearts in Atlantis with Anthony Hopkins, which we discussed, mm -hmm. I think, briefly on our Stephen King episode way back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this was one of his final performances, um, and I think maybe his final leading performance. Uh, I think he, the Star Trek movie came out, uh, the last one he was in, where he played Chekhov, uh, came out after that. He died in a freak accident um at his home when his um uh, involving his car i don't want to get into the details but uh very sad very um very tragic passing great performance one to check out um, green room netflix yeah and I, i'll just double down it's an excellent movie and it's yes. definitely more um more suspense yeah absolutely um it's got it's got just enough of that horror element to unsettle yep. you you know yep you're 100 percent right you're absolutely right. All right. I'm going to go with my first movie. I'll stick also with Netflix. Now, I didn't do the same thing. I'm I'm going to be all over the place uh, talking about a handful of different, uh, different things. But my first movie is also on Netflix, and it is the opposite in tenor. Um, <laughs> it is The Death of Stalin. And tenor of is Stalin. how my dad says antenna. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <Yeah. laughs> Sorry. And Just move tenor. the antenna. <laughs> anyway, sorry, go ahead. No, that's good. No, uh, Death of Stalin, 2017 movie written and directed by Armando Iannucci. Um, have you seen Death of Stalin? I have. It's great. Yeah. I love it. It, it. it is great. It stars an ensemble cast of uh, Steve Buscemi, Jason Isaacs, Jeffrey Tambor, and many others. If you're not familiar with Armando Iannucci, he's a uh, British uh, writer and director. He got uh he kind of made his name doing uh british political humor uh came to the u.s and did veep on hbo which is just fantastic and cutting he's known for his very sharp and witty uh humor and uh very very quick-witted 
um, dialogue. And so he, he went and, uh, after he left Veep, uh, he, he went and made this movie. It, it covers the power struggle after the death of Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin in 1953, uh, which sounds, uh, not fun nice. at all. <laughs> uh, but this is completely done with flair and humor and there's physical humor, almost like pratfall level physical yeah. humor, but not done for laughs. Like it's, I mean, it is, but it's not like it's it's not slapstick, but there are pratfalls. Yeah. But it's like it's quick witted, it's dry, uh, dry wit. You know, there's some some of that rye stuff, but uh, just very watchable and and funny and and for, informative. I I really like it. Uh, just you know, have some fun, sit back, enjoy Death of Stalin on Netflix. Yeah, I, I, so this was one – it had been out for a little bit when I finally saw it. I'm pretty sure you were the one who were, was really at bat for it. I mean I'd heard good things, but then I think you had checked it out and told me, like, you need to really see this movie. And I love – you know, it's just such a different way to tell a historical story. I mean, like, kind of to your oh, yeah. point, you know, you know, Hollywood loves making historical dramas and stuff, but they're usually just homework and they're hard to get through. This yep. is – a mostly true story, you know, obviously, um, it's, uh, you know, there's some embellishments and they mess around with the timeline a little bit from what I read, but, um, but I mean, it's a, tr- essentially a true story, a historical comedy, but I mean, it's, but it's got some really harrowing scenes and it's, um, it takes some surprising, goes some surprising places that you wouldn't expect it to go when you're seeing the humor as it's happening. And, um, and I also just love that, like, you know, so many movies, they, uh, you know, this is all based, you know, set in Russia. You have Steve Buscemi and Jason Isaacs and Jeffrey Tambor, who are noticeably not Russian, nor do they try to do a Russian accent. Oh, no, and, not at all. And they, I appreciated that more than them doing a bad one or inexplicably doing a British accent, which is what, you know, a lot of a lot of um, filmmakers would probably do. Like, just do a British accent. Americans won't know. <laughs> yeah, they'll. It's all foreign to them, you know. <laughs> if yeah. you're not in America, you're British, you know. Yes. But uh, that's yeah, how we. It, that's how we've always run it. All ancient yes. Rome, all <laughs> er, everything, British. Um, but yeah, Death of Stalin, great, great choice and a great movie, definitely. I second that motion. Um, well, so, I second this emotion. <laughs> it's your turn. No. Yay! So I'm gonna go with. So my next two are from Prime. I'm gonna go with my first Prime pick, or uh, excuse me, Amazon Unbox. Uh, <laughs> so my first one uh, is Clue. All right, Ooh, you go ahead, Jason. Uh, no, I'm just <laughs> um, no, my first, my my uh, my next one's Clue from. Like I said, it's on Amazon Prime right now. Um, 1985 film directed by Jonathan Lynn who co-wrote with comedy legend John Landis, who wrote Animal House and Blues Brothers and uh, Icon and uh, comedy movies. Um, it is based on the Who Done It board game that we all know and uh, don't know how much people love it. I like it a lot. I think it's a fun game. But, um, yeah, based on the board game, the movie features uh, some like really heavyweight comedic talents of the 70s and 80s, such as Tim Curry, uh, Madeline Kahn, um, from uh, Blazing Saddles, um, mm-hmm. Michael McKeon, uh, who is uh, a very uh, young genius, very yes, young, yes. very yes. handsome Mac- Michael McKeon. Yes, I, yes. And yes. Uh, and for, for the strangely, I didn't think about this. The second mention on the episode, Christopher Lloyd, <laughs> great Scott. <laughs> yes, um, they're all playing the characters from except for Tim Curry. All of the the cast. I mean, there's also you got uh, Martin Mulls in this. Um, oh, I'm drawing a blank on a couple other names, but um, all comedy people that you recognize and are like great character actors and just great uh, comedy legends. Um, Tim Curry, sort of the main character in this one, he plays a butler named Wadsworth, um, and it's basically a movie version of the board game. Them trying to figure out who murdered Mr. Body, um, and all the support, all the Ensemble cast is the, you know, Mrs. Scarlet and Professor Plum and Colonel Mustard. Uh, it is a bit of a cult classic now, um, but I really can't recommend it enough. I have I think I saw this movie when I was like 10 years old. My dad loves this style of comedy. And it is um, at times very broad, 
almost slapstick comedy, similar to uh, Death of Stalin. A lot of Pratt Falls, a lot of really just fast paced, like physical comedy. Um, but there's also some really great like wordplay and puns and like really witty dialogue. And like, it's one of those movies that you'll notice something different every time you come back to it. And just, uh, it is, uh, it's, it's, uh, it goes under the radar. I think it's in recent years, it's gotten a little more, I think it's gotten a little more notice as this cult classic, but, uh, they're apparently working on a remake. Ryan Reynolds is supposed to be producing it, maybe starring in it. Jason Bateman was attached to direct it, but he just dropped out. Now they've got, um, James Bovin who did, uh, the Muppet, uh, movie with um jason siegel and the sequel muppets most wanted uh it's now attached to directed i don't know how i feel about that because i love this one and my opinion is never try to remake a cult classic because the whole reason it's good is because it is a cult classic like you know don't try to remake rocky horror picture show you know don't remake office space that it's lightning in a bottle that's what made it you know um but clue on prime is is hilarious. It's, uh, I love the set pieces, the mansion, the, it's based in the fifties. It's just, the music's great in it. Like it's, um, as I've mentioned before and my love of Mad Men, I love that era. So there's probably a part of that too, but great movie. So I've tried to start this three times this week. I've, <laughs> um, I've, I think I'm about 18 or 20 minutes in Okay. And f- th- because there's interruptions and things and whatever, but this was on my list of things to watch during, during the, the quarantine. Okay. Um, I, I feel like it is just so slow at this point and it's not picking up steam. And I'm like, I'm at the point where they've just received their gifts. Is it about it, to pick up? Yes, very much. Okay. It okay. takes it a minute to, yeah. It, I mean, they introduce everyone. And they yeah. set up some stuff like it starts kind of slow. It's really it's I feel once, like it's dragging right now. Yeah. No. Once once it gets once the murder happens and everything gets going, it doesn't stop. And okay. then it's hilarious. And it's also okay. famously got three endings. So when it was out in theaters, you never knew which ending you were going to get because it's supposed to be kind of like they were trying to recreate the end of the board game. You know, you know, you don't know, you know, who, which, uh, you know what's in that envelope in the game. So there was three endings that they just would play at different theaters. Um, the DVD, so which one's on the DVD or on prime DVD you could pick. So the DVD copy I had, you could pick a, B or C and oh, well, you would pick an ending on prime. It pro or you could pick show all the endings and it would say, basically the ending would happen and say, or maybe this happened and then it would take you back okay. and it would show each ending. That's probably what's okay. on prime. If I had to guess. It probably is. Well, I'll I'll try to I'll try to power through it. Um, yeah, get get through the first like like I said. Once the murder happens, everything picks up. I love it, and yeah. it's not for everybody. Right. I mean, again, it's it is kind of slapsticky at times, but um, sure. Clue, love it. All right, my next movie is also on Netflix. Now I debated putting this on here because I don't want to make people more depressed, but um, this I put it on here because this person is uh this movie is about a character who is quarantined he is by himself i'm talking of 2009's moon oh, i thought you were gonna on say Bubble Boy with jake gyllenhaal no no <laughs> no uh 2009's moon directed by duncan jones the son of david bowie um he's directed a couple movies i've seen and a couple i haven't i think the other movie i saw of his was source code uh, that he did oh, right after that's Moon. Good. Yeah, yeah, I like that movie. Yeah. So this follows uh, Sam Rockwell's character, uh, who is an astronaut. He is a man who is alone on the moon, and he is experiencing a personal crisis as he nears a three-year stint, the end of a three-year stint, where he's been mining on the far side of the moon. Um, the only other voice, the only other actor in this is Kevin Spacey as the voice of the computer, Gertie. Um, other than that, no other characters are on here. So it's very kind of limited from a, a storytelling, from a character perspective. Um, it kind so of it, starts limited from yes. a location, but it expands a little bit, but, um, it's so what you're telling us is half the cast is, is sexual predators. Maybe all the cast. I don't know. <laughs> 
I don't know what's in Sam Rockwell's. I don't know the skeletons in Rockwell's closet. (laughs) That's right. Look, what I've learned, if Me Too's taught me anything, I assume the worst until you're proven innocent. Yeah, or Tom Um, Hanks. Or you're Tom Hanks. Um, No, Moon is, I don't want to say too much about it or give too much away, uh, but it is, uh, it's intriguing, it's thought-provoking, it's very, um, it's, it's very quiet at times, mm-hmm. but it's, uh, it's, uh, have you seen it? Did you ever see it? I have not that I it's, can recall. It's worthwhile. It's, it's, it's worthwhile just for, as a, an achievement of storytelling. I always get uh, this movie mixed up with that movie with, I think it's Billy Bob Thornton who, uh, who like makes a rocket in his backyard or something. What is that movie I'm thinking of? October Sky? No, it was more recent. Maybe it's not Billy Bob Thornton, but there was a Rocket movie. Rocket Man? That, no. <laughs> with Harlan Williams? Yes. <laughs> I love um, Harlan Williams, by the I way. I do, too. I do, too. He's great. Um, but uh, nah, that, that's not worth taking up time for. But there was some other movie that came out that had something to do with space, astronaut, something. But it was like a weird sort of indie movie. And I always get those two confused. So, um, But yeah, Moon, Netflix. Sounds fun. Yeah, it's it's not that fun, but it's <laughs> it's an enjoyable movie to watch, and I don't want to depress people or make them feel sure. any more alone than they are. But I thought it was apropos because of the quietness. Sure. Your last well, movie, Jess. Yes, my last movie. Now this one is a bit of a deeper pull, um, but it is on Prime, and I'm very uh, was very happy to see. And I need to revisit it. I've seen it a couple of times. Um, so a couple years after it came out, just kind of randomly rented it at a blockbuster. Um, and, uh, that is a movie called Lake Mungo, M U N G O Lake Mungo. It's currently streaming on prime or <clears throat> excuse me, Amazon unbox. Uh, it is a 2008 Australian psychological, I don't want to say horror film, but that's probably one of its subgenres. Um, psychological horror film written and directed by a man named Joel Anderson. Um, so the movie is shot as a mockumentary or it's shot in like documentary style, but it's a mockumentary talking heads. I mean, it's, it plays exactly like a documentary and the movie basically recalls the events surrounding the tragic drowning death of a 16 year old girl and the potentially supernatural events surrounding her death and, uh, in the wake of her death and her family struggled to cope with grief and, um, these sort of uh, unanswered questions about their, their daughter. Um, it, like I said, it's done like a, a documentary. It's, really effective in looking at grief and um and just sort of looking at how this family is handling this tragedy um again it's all actors i mean but you really wouldn't know i mean it's some really effective performances nobody that i really know maybe they're big in australian cinema but um no one that i recognized which i think helps the viewing experience um i remember when i rented it i had to kind of like look online at the time and see if it was like a documentary. Um, but there are some supernatural elements. There's some twists and turns and things, um, that might be kind of polarizing. I don't want to give, obviously I'm not, I don't want to give too much away. I won't give anything away, but, um, there are some story choices they make that I don't think will sit well with some people. Um, but I loved it. Uh, it makes it, it just makes the story, um, more compelling when it has these sort of different um, genre elements like horror and, um, you know, some supernatural um, elements going on. And this otherwise a story about grief and death. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it sounds it's a really, fantastic. It's, it's a, re- it's a really interesting, unique um, psychological suspense sort of horror movie. But like I said, but it's got some, um, I'll compare it to the village in that, you're sort of expecting a thing and some other stuff happens. But so if you go in like, you know, like it, the, that's where the movie maybe make, I don't want to, I, I don't call it a mistake, but I, I think it's, it could have a polarizing response if you guys check it out. Um, okay. It, it, I'm, where I'm it goes it may not work for some people, but it really works for me. I think you'll like it. You liked that movie, A Ghost Story, a lot, right? With uh, sure did. With um, Casey Affleck and is it Rooney yeah. Mara? It is Rooney. 
Seven um, straight minutes uncut of her eating a pie. Yeah, I think you'll really like this movie. There's a 12-minute cobbler scene. <laughs> oh, man. Um, <laughs> the movie Shoemaker, ends a, huh? <laughs> it's the second week in a row we mentioned cobblers. <laughs> um, well, I'm going to anyway, check it out. I'm going to check Lake it out. Mongo, I find it very interesting, very compelling. I've seen it a couple times. I remember I watched it the first time with a friend of mine I used to have an apartment with for uh, my wife and I were got married and we were dating at a apartment with a friend of mine and we rented it on a whim just had had nothing didn't know anything about it It was around halloween we want to watch a horror movie and we got this and it was something completely different than what we were expecting again the story choices they make really landed with me he was not as happy with it (laughs) but the movie at times for me and him i mean at the time 21 years old watching the movie we had to like turn the lights on and stuff and i'm a horror movie guy like i i don't you know stuff doesn't bother me we had to like turn lights on like there's some really effective <laughs> creepy stuff going on in this movie um that's also just like i said but the under with an undertone of just kind of grief and sadness and <laughs> it's perfect for sitting alone in your house <laughs> after three weeks of isolation perfect yes um, wake mungo so, yes my final choice and uh, I'm not going to linger too much on this because we talked pretty much uh, – we talked a good bit about this one a few weeks ago. Uh, I was surprised in my research to find that the day this episode drops, you can watch Parasite on Hulu. That's right. This year's Best Picture winner at the Oscars will be available on Hulu on April 8th, directed by uh, Bong Joon-ho and winner of so many like best picture, best director, best sent best uh, international best, picture, best international picture, screenplay, screenplay. screenplay yeah, yeah. Your original screenplay. It's unbelievable how much it won. I don't want to get too much into it. It's a South Korean film about class and race structure. Um, and there are horror and thriller elements of this. There is, I mean, there's just so many angles and so yeah. many layers to this movie. It's uh, it's really, really good. Uh, you're gonna have to uh, read it. It's foreign language, but it, you don't even notice it. Like right, I think we said that on a previous episode. Yeah. Like the way you, you're, you're in. Um, I wanted to bring this up, even though we recently talked about it, just because it's streamable and it's the perfect time if you've got Hulu. Hop right on in there and uh, and enjoy. I, I agree. Can't, I, I I'll re- I'm going enough. to be rewatching. That's uh, You're, same here. Same here. I've been waiting on it to stream, and so I was very pleased to find that. Um, so that's my third movie. I am going to cheat as I often do with our format, and I'm going to throw in two other movies that I wanted to throw in in the documentary category. So for those of you who are wanting to escape and learn more about somebody, I'm going to throw in two documentaries. One I saw was on Hulu streaming. It's called Hero Dreams of Sushi. And it's a detailed documentary about a uh, aging uh, sushi maker in uh, Japan. He is in a, I believe his restaurant is one of the most expensive, if not the most expensive sushi place in the world. Mm. And it is in a subway station in Tokyo. Wow. And uh, it's, it's about him and his food, but it's also about his son. And I found it very intriguing. I saw it uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, and I think it's I think it's really, really good. And then a Netflix documentary do- uh, recommendation is Uppity. Uppity is a racing documentary about a man named Willie T. Ribs, um, who was the first black man to race in the Indy 500. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's kind of about the racial divide in the 70s and 80s in the racing community, in NASCAR, and a lot of different things. And he is just a a singular um, individual. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting story about, uh, about his life, but it is called uppity. That sounds, and that that is on Netflix. Yeah. So I just wanted to throw those in there. I didn't want to get by without that. Um, So we're going to move on to TV. Yes. And we'll do the same kind of thing. Um, I, I don't have a lot to say about the TV other than I'm just going to say, here's where you can get it and go watch it. But yeah. um, I want to kind of go back and forth yeah, on this in a similar style. If you'll take it off, Jess. Absolutely. So I, uh, 
again, I am not as well versed in TV as you are, Jason. I haven't seen quite as many things. I'm half convinced that you start, you wanted to start this podcast with me um, just to get me to watch more TV. It has not worked out well for you, but I do know a lot about <laughs> bottled water. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and I know that grape nuts are terrible. Um, I still have not watched Killing Eve. Um, <laughs> oh, but uh, for my four it's coming out soon. <laughs> for my uh, for my first television show, it is on Netflix, um, which I was very happy to see because I had literally filled my DVR with episodes of it. Um, and that is the Twilight Zone, mm. uh, the original. Not the new one on CBS's subscription service, CBS All Access, I think it's called, that's currently yep. um, produced, presented by Jordan Peele. I do like Jordan Peele. I just don't see the point in all these Twilight, show, Twilight Zone revivals that they've tried over the years when the original is still so good and holds up really well. Um, so it was created in 1958 by Rod Serling. I mean, I think we all know Twilight Zone. He served as the narrator and the presenter also, but this was his brainchild he had richard uh, matheson was a uh, renowned sci-fi writer wrote for the show i mean there's some really great stuff in here um it's an anthology series each episode features a story typically with elements of science fiction or horror or suspense genres um but serling felt these genres were useful vessels for messages on racism society the government politics um technology and it's very it's it's you know the it's what black me black mirror is doing the same thing today but in a more modern sense obviously um twilight zone the messages and stuff still really hold up where the special effects maybe don't you know it is in the 50s it's, it was a tv show it didn't have a big budget some of the stuff is a the effects and the presentations a little dated but the creativity the originality make it in my opinion hold up it's one of my favorite shows of all time. I think everyone knows about it. We all know the theme song. We all know the tropes and things of it. But mm-hmm. I don't think a lot of people have actually sat down to watch it. And I no, really I think I people it. should. Okay. Um, it's an anthology show, like I mentioned. So you can pick up anywhere you want. My recommendation, Google the top 25 episodes and just start. And it, I think you'll be surprised at how good it is. It's like 22 minutes long an episode. Good. It's easy. goes down smooth. There's some really good twists and turns in these episodes and, um, and some, some commentary on society that still holds up today. Okay. I'm look. I'm looking forward to diving in. This is a, a, a blind spot in my resume. <laughs> All right. Um, I am going to, I'll go ahead and jump on with Netflix as well. So I kind of broke my TV up into, uh, three different streamers. Okay. So for Netflix, I'm going to make, uh, I'm making my comedy picks on Netflix. All right. So first off is I thought everybody could enjoy and use some, some, uh, stand up comedy. And yes. my favorites or one of my favorite stand up comedians working right now is John Mulaney. He has uh, three stand up specials plus a, I don't know what to call it, an after school special <laughs> that's going on. Yeah. Um, he's got, uh, anyway, Kid Gorgeous at Radio City is the newest stand up special. It is hilarious. I've watched it two or three times and I always laugh. There, there are a handful of bits in there that are just unbelievable he's got new in town and i think comeback kid uh those are the other two um i've seen each of them once but the kid gorgeous one i've seen the most i think it's his best and then he's got john mulaney and the sack lunch bunch which is a uh an after school kind of 70s or 80s after school special and i just want to ask you if you've had meal and (laughs) (laughs) which which if you watch you'll get the reference but it's uh it's just a he's funny his his um his dry comedic sense but look by the way he's the best host every year on saturday night live even if you're not a saturday night live person uh if you can get you can stream episodes of that on hulu uh go back and just look up the mulaney episodes from the last two or three years they are single-handedly the funniest episode of every season well he understands the show well he was a writer and he wrote some of their best skits oh, yeah. from like the um Kristen Wiig, Jason Sudeikis, Bill Hader yep. era. 
He wrote yep. all the Stefan uh, skits um, yep. for Weekend Update. He wrote the Californians. I think he came up with that one. Um, yep. He he knows the show's uh, sensibilities really well. And uh, when we do best and worst of SNL, um, we will definitely be talking about that era because I love that era of SNL. But sure. I agree. This is a great one. John Mulaney. And he, I, don't, I would say his comedy is not quite for everyone, as the case with any comedian, obviously. Yeah. Otherwise, if, if everyone had the same comic sensibilities, no one would have liked Jeff Dunham. Um, but... Uh, John Mulaney's stuff is really good. That Sack Lunch Bunch is so different, so original. Um, it takes itself seriously, but not too seriously. Like it, it, it's really good. I, I, yes, I loved it. And then I'm gonna have a bonus Netflix throw in that I just thought of. Um, this is something that you can watch with the family. And I thought with us being stuck inside, this is something that you can kind of expand your borders. It's a food travel show called Somebody Feed Phil. And it is it stars Phil Rosenthal, who is the showrunner, co-creator of Everybody Loves Raymond. He's hilarious. Uh, he travels all over the, the world sampling food. And, and, and in, you get a sense of the city. You get a sense of the, the history, the food. And then he always calls his parents on Skype at one point in the episode. And they are just two of the funniest old people you've ever <laughs> seen in your life. And uh, I cannot, I watch it with the whole family. We love it. Seen every episode. Uh, somebody feed Phil on Netflix. Nice. All right. All right. You're next. Next guy. for me. Uh, also on Netflix. All my TV shows are on Netflix. Uh, this one is currently streaming. It's fifth season, or excuse me, it's currently airing its fifth season on AMC. I won't stay on it too long because I've, mentioned it on past episodes, but everyone needs to be watching Better Call Saul. Yep. Um, the first four seasons are on Netflix, um, which was really what got Breaking Bad into everyone's consciousness. Breaking Bad, of course, was doing great as far as critical reviews and stuff. It wasn't putting up big numbers in the ratings until it started streaming on Netflix. I'm hoping something similar happens with this show. Um, Better Call Saul is fantastic. It's a Breaking Bad spinoff, which almost seems derogatory, but that's basically what it is. Created by Vince Gilligan, who was creator of Breaking Bad, and Peter Gould, who's basically the showrunner. Vince Gilligan doesn't have a huge hand in it. Comes in to direct some episodes, has some say-so in the writing, story direction, but this is really Peter Gould's baby. Um, revolves around Jimmy McGill, who, a.k.a. Saul Goodman, who was Walter White's lawyer and Better Call Saul. Um, and it just tells the story of his descent into becoming Saul Goodman and becoming this criminal lawyer. And you get his backstory. You get a lot of backstory for people who would pop, who are in Breaking Bad. Uh, most um, notably, Mike Ehrmantraut, the perpetually grumpy old man slash hit man slash enforcer from Breaking Bad. Fan favorite. Um, if you're a Breaking Bad fan, it's a must see because it's a spinoff that elevates the other show it came from, which is rare. Um, you see these people's lives and better call Saul in a greater detail than you knew them in breaking bad. And it just makes the chaos and destruction that came from Walter white and breaking bad that much more impactful when you're watching an episode and at any, there's like a scene, like I forget which episode, but there's a scene where there's four people on screen. Every one of them's lives get ruined by Walter white and breaking bad. And I just, it makes breaking bad that much more effective because you're like, wow, you oh, yeah. know, he really like Walter White was a chaotic force that just left a path of destruction in its wake. Um, the show's a bit slower; it's more deliberate than Breaking Bad, um, but it and it's its own thing. I mean, like I said, to call it a spinoff seems you know like you're selling it short, but it's its own thing for sure. Um, in some ways, possibly better. I mean, no, it's it, better. It, it, I'm it's, just gonna say it's better. It's made better with show. more intent and experienced writers yeah. and directors. You know, like yep. they just these are just people who you know, new, they just, this, they're seasoned at this point. This is essentially season eight through 13 of Breaking Bad, right? Yeah, and so much, it's the yeah. same people, the same creators who really know what they're doing. No, it's, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. Yeah. Watch, go watch it. Enjoy yourself. Um, better call and Saul. Awesome. I'll real quick. I don't have, I'll just real quick throw in my, my last one. I don't have a yeah, ton to say it. about it. It's not, it's not going to be for everyone, but 
uh, a lot of mine have been heavy and horror and suspense driven. So this is my, my funny one. Um, Conan without borders, uh, is currently on Netflix. Uh, Conan O'Brien's a big reason. I think I am the person I am today for better or worse. Um, I've been watching his, him on TV since I was 11 years old. Um, if you're a fan of his sense of humor, um, or, if you're a fan of like dry sense of humor, you've never watched Conan. I think this is a good introduction to him. Um, this, uh, without watching kind of the stuffy talk show format. Um, so Conan is always sort of famously, at least among his fan base known for doing what are called remotes where he sort of gets out of the studio, interacts with people at a music festival or a concert or a, a comic convention or an old timey baseball game. Like, um, or in the case of this show, Conan without borders, uh, he goes to other countries and spends a week in that country learning about their culture and um, and trying different dishes. And it's a travel show, basically. Um, he what what works for the show, aside from his style, sense of humor, if that is and if that's your thing um, or think it might be your thing. The show is oddly like un, unexpectedly uh, really insightful culturally and it's really respectful to these other cultures that he goes to and these other countries, um, that he interacts with. Um, he never, Conan never makes anyone the butt of the joke, but himself, it's all very, uh, reverent for these, um, for these, uh, these other countries and these people. And it's very respectful. It's a really, you learn a lot. He does a, an episode in South Korea that uh, he really got into some of the heavier aspects of their history. He's a mm-hmm. huge history buff and that some of that comes across in the show, but, um, Conan Without Borders is hilarious. Um, I definitely recommend it. Um, again, maybe not for everybody. I know people who hate Conan O'Brien, but we call them Jay Leno fans. Um, yeah, but, right. uh, but Conan Without this, Borders is hilarious yeah. and, and uh, insightful. This has been in my queue forever. It's one of those things I've been meaning to watch and waiting to watch. And I'll now now's probably the time to start. And, yeah, and, uh, and, we'll and enjoy more, this. We're getting more from him. He's changed the format of his talk show so that it allows him more time to do stuff like this. And he's, I know I listened to his podcast and he's mentioned recently some new episodes that he's done and some traveling that he's done to other countries. And uh, it's great yeah. stuff he's done. Uh, he's went all over the place. He's went to Australia. He's went to Mexico. He's went to Ghana. He's went to Cuba. He's he's done South Korea. He's done. Um, He's done a lot of them, and and there's some that there's some clips and stuff that aren't on Netflix. They're on YouTube, so you can check it out there too if you like what you see on Netflix. But uh, um, Conan Without Borders definitely recommend. Awesome. Um, all right, my last two, and I'm just gonna run through these. Uh, something that I don't know if you knew, um, listeners out there, HBO is making a lot of their product available free um, during the coronavirus outbreak. And people stuck home and uh, s- streaming, they are making it free through either the HBO Go or the HBO Now app. You can download either one um, on your smart TV, your device, whatever. And uh, there's a limited list of things that are available, some movies, some TV shows. Um, the two that I'm going to recommend are uh, were on my best of 2019 uh, when we did that episode uh, earlier this year. Uh, there's two seasons of Succession that are available. Succession, I think, is one of the, the best shows, maybe the best show on television right now. Um, one hour drama, comedy, craziness, rich people doing awful things. Uh, it's it's just it's excellent, uh, smart, witty writing. Um, then you've also got Barry, uh, also on my uh, Best of 2019, two seasons starring Bill Hader. It's a very funny, dark comedy that that just goes in insane places. 30-minute um, show that I would recommend checking out. Those are both free to everyone with the app on, nice. uh, on HBO. And then I'll throw in another Hulu for those Hulu fans out there. Uh, through a recent partnership with uh, FX... Um, all of FX's content is now streamable on Hulu. In fact, they've got, uh, through their partnership being both owned by Disney now, um, they, they've they got a handful of things that are directly on uh, Hulu. It's called FX on Hulu. So uh, a couple of things that I would recommend streaming. Uh, Fargo, which are kind of miniseries. Uh, they're 
10 episode kind of standalone series. They, they, they're tangential to each other. They've done three of them so far. The third one doesn't need to be seen, but the first two, they, they, you can watch them independently in any order, but they are, uh, they are related to one another, but, uh, they're fantastic. They exist within the world of the Coen brothers movie Fargo. Uh, but they are not a retelling of the same story, but they are similar sensibilities, similar character types. Um, and this is, uh, this is done by Noah Hawley, who was a, um, he's, he's been showrunner on this. He did the show Legion on FX as well. He's written novels. He's a very good storyteller. Um, nice. and then, uh, that's my hour long recommendation there. And then two half hour at recommendations, Atlanta, which is, uh, another just, when it's on, it's one of the best things on television. Um, season three is coming next year, I believe. It's already already shot. Uh, should be out next year. But there's two seasons on here. And Baskets, which is yes. a very quirky, weird show that just wrapped up its final season. So it's got four seasons um, of eight episodes. Very digestible, 30 minutes. And Louis Anderson is... Uh, unbelievable it's yeah. it's just it's just absolutely excellent so check out baskets i gotta catch and up with baskets i watched the first season and then and fell off but loved the i may have watched the first like season and a half but uh it yeah it's great louis anderson's awesome and it zach galifianakis is great and i've heard that he gets better as the show goes um yes he does but, yeah um so good recommendations yes so it wouldn't be bowo mm-hmm if we only talked about the best of, and <laughs> I'm trying to try to bring only positivity sure. in this time, but uh, we've got to stay true to ourselves and bring some sure. uh, worst of. So Jesse, why don't you throw on uh, some of the worst things? We're just going to tell you stuff to avoid. Don't yes. watch this. If you're flicking through Netflix or your Apple TV or your Roku and you're like, yeah, maybe we'll watch this. Stop. Don't. Don't Jesse, go. listen to us. <laughs> um First one, Netflix movie Cloverfield Paradox. Awful movie is terrible. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan of the Clover, the first Cloverfield movie. Um, the found, you know, handheld found footage monster movie Cloverfield. I love that movie. Not everyone does. Uh, you know, some the film style turns some people off. I think it's a great movie. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, the sequel, uh, sort of sequel, loose sequel. <laughs> um, the uh, 10 Cloverfield Lane with John Goodman and Mary Elizabeth Winstead is a really fantastic. Yeah. And, um, but then they made Cloverfield Paradox, which was a made, a, from what I understand, a completed, almost a completed movie or a script for a different movie that wasn't getting, like, it wasn't getting picked up. No one wanted to make this movie. And Netflix said, hey, we'll make it and we'll make it a Cloverfield movie. Uh, J.J. Abrams was a uh, pro- executive producer on it. I'm almost sure producer on it. And they kind of shoehorned in some Cloverfield stuff to make it a Cloverfield movie. And it is uh, front to back garbage. So if you are a Cloverfield fan, if you saw those first two and you're, you see this one and say, hey, I like those first two, two Cloverfield movies, avoid. It is, uh, if any, it's almost bad enough to make me like the other one, the other two less. That's, yeah. um, it's not good. Um, for TV, um, I always say that this show is the worst show that I've seen every single episode of, and that is True Blood, which is currently streaming <laughs> on Prime. Um, it was uh, a different time in my life. Um, <laughs> I think we watched it, me and my wife watched it after our son was born, and we were like home and not going out and home with him. And we had heard, we had friends who liked it and had read the books and stuff, the Sookie Stackhouse books. We started watching it. We, right before the last season started, we just binged like six seasons of the show in like two weeks. And then the last season started. And once I got to a one episode a week pace, I just turned to my wife one day after we watched an episode, a new episode. And I looked at her and I was like, this show is terrible. <laughs> like, yep. I hadn't realized it while we were binging it because it was just coming. The first couple seasons are the first season's good. The second season's not bad. And then it falls off hard and it is not good. If you've ever wondered if you should watch True Blood, I recommend avoiding it. There's, as Jason will tell you, there's a lot of great TV out there. True yes. Blood is not one of them. Um, yeah. And uh, it's for some people maybe, but uh, for, I hear the books are good. Go read the books. Don't but avoid the show. It's, it's only going to disappoint you. Avoid the show. 
Now, I'm going to tell you, this was very hard for me to come up with worst of. I uh, pride myself on kind of pre-curating my watch and sure. the things that I'm going to watch. And so it is rare that I watch something that I would consider bad. Um, so as I search through my kind of watch history and two things that, that uh, these are both on Netflix. So the first thing I'm going to pull up, just if you are thinking about watching in any, any of the direct to Netflix Sandler movies, uh, Adam Sandler movies, whether it's the ridiculous six or the, I don't know whatever else he did. The only one I've seen all the way through is the murder mystery one with Jennifer Aniston. Even he did it's one with not, David Spade that was yes, almost yeah. okay at times, but still pretty bad. There's one Sandy Wexler. That's just a yeah. full inside joke where he just plays his own agent. It, it, they're just awful. There's so many better ways. There's so many better movies on mm-hmm. Netflix. Please there's go better watch Adam those. Sandler, there's better Adam there's Sandler movies. Better Adam Sandler movies. Go watch them. And then I can't believe what I'm about to say. All right. <laughs> so as I'm listening, going through this, this is my hot take. Okay. Okay. Um, I watched this show because it is in the zeitgeist right now, but I don't think I get it. I don't mm-hmm. understand. It's it's okay. It's fine. It's funny at times. Uh, Tiger King on Netflix. <laughs> is there go watch any of the things I've mentioned today yeah. and it's a better use of seven hours of your time. It oh, is just sure. not, it is just not, uh, do not rush out and see this. I feel like I was bit again with the, uh, you know, the old, uh, Facebook. Uh, yeah, I got it. You gotta go watch this. You gotta go watch yeah. this. Um, making a murderer it to me is the only one that ever held up. But yeah. uh, it's okay. It's okay. I just think it's overhyped at this point. And just it if is, you have other options, go there. Yeah. It's lightning in a bottle. If this show came on when we weren't all stuck in our homes and just desperate for anything to connect us, I don't think it would be landing no. the way it is. Um, I agree. Go watch The Keepers. It's not as fun, but The Keepers is a great docuseries that Netflix did. Netflix has the good ones occasionally. Um, this one, uh, I, it's just a big meme party. That's why everyone likes it. It's just meme after meme after meme after character after character after just, you know, like it's just, um, it's all like on the surface, very fun and just very silly. And, but for me where I've landed with it and I watched it all and I enjoyed it. I was compelled overall, but, um, there's not a lot of substance there. And then I just l- have been thinking um they made a lot of i feel like they made light of a lot of really tragic things you know what i mean like just the animals yep. alone is really all of the stuff with the animals is really sad but then like joe exotic's two husbands there's clearly a, you know there's this whole show is a culture of abuse and emotional abuse physical abuse drug use enabling and we're and none of I don't feel like a lot of that we're paying attention to that as much because that's all wrapped in a silk leopard print shirt and a mullet. You know, I I'm not being a stick in the mud. I think I think the memes are hilarious. I think there's a lot of funny stuff that came out of this. But I found myself ultimately after all of that kind of has worn off a little bit, just sort of feeling bad for everybody. Yep. Except for Carol Baskins and Doc Antle and Joe Exotic. I don't feel bad for any of them. But, oh, and Jeff Lowe. <laughs> no, I don't feel bad for them, but I do feel bad for the other people that got caught up in it. But yeah, if you must go watch, but I'm just going to go ahead and yeah. warn you. It's got, it's not going to be the best thing you saw that week. No, it's, it's, it's just not, it, it'll be, it'll be a thing you saw and you would talk to your neighbor about, and you could, you understood what the memes on Facebook were. And you know what, in this, you know, I'll, I'll endorse it as a watch for this reason. It's something that'll connect you into a conversation people are having in a time when we all could use a little more connection. So. Okay. All right. Thanks for bringing it home and undercutting my worst stuff. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us today. Please subscribe, rate, and review us. Um, as always, find us on Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, YouTube, Instagram, and more. Email us at boapod at gmail.com. Hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the other places. Send us an email. Interact with us. Help spread the word. We love you. Yes, I think everything is at Bowopod, all our social media stuff. Um, Go check out some of the things we mentioned and let us know how wrong or right we are. I would love to hear what people think about Lake Mungo. And um, I would love to uh, hear what you guys think about Tiger King. (laughs) 
Um, anything, let us know. If you're a True Blood fan, tell me how I just didn't get it. I got it wrong. It went over my head. Um, thanks to the band Amiga out of Charlotte, North Carolina, as always, for the music throughout the episode. To Wes Corbis for our podcast artwork. And most of all, thank you guys for listening to Best of, Worst of. Stay inside. Yes. Do not go outside. Expedition Log, Entry 3039. Day 389 on this desolate husk that we now know was called Earth by its inhabitants. Our exploratory mission has been a success. While there are still many questions as to what led to Earth's rapid downfall and subsequent complete economic and social collapse, we have learned much of its culture based off archaeological record. It appears the Earthlings served an eccentric monarch known as Joseph Exotic, who employed a large army of carnivorous felines to rule the planet in tyranny. Fossil record indicates bathroom cleansing parchment was plentiful and apparently largely unused, suggesting a role as a primitive currency. Efforts to fully decode Earthling language have been fruitless, or to quote our subjects, hard AF. (laughs) 